Hey there, thank you for joining me. Today we're going to talk about bivariate and multivariate maps. Bi bivariate maps, that sounds intimidating. It's not. Mm, it sounds weird and bizarre, and it can be. It definitely can be. It doesn't have to be. Let's check it out. Here is a bivariate map showing fires and population. Bivariate. Bi meaning two, variate meaning variables. Two or more variables all at once. And when we say multivariate, you know, that can mean bivariate. So two or more variables. But why would you even make one? To show perhaps a relationship between two or more different phenomena. So here I'm showing the relationship between instances of fire and where people live. Check out this example. So this is from the mid 1800s. It's wind and ocean currents in the Gulf of Mexico. Isn't this crazy? So clearly this is somebody who is taking multivariate mapping to its extreme. You know, multivariate maps aren't new. There is nothing new under the sun. It's all been done before. And in this case, they did it all in one shot. And this illustrates a pretty important factor, which is cognitive load. How much information can fit in somebody's working memory at one time? Are you just throwing too much at them at once, as is probably the case here? Well, that's up to you. How much can you get away with? How simply can you design it? Um, how trained is your audience? That sort of thing. So for example, this requires a legend that looks like this. I mean, check this out. Uh, the little dot and the direction and the shape of its little light scatter has to do with what kind of wind it is, how gently or strong the wind is. And it goes on to say what direction the wind was blowing. Was it blowing this way all day or part of the day? The length of the era has to do with how strong the current is. So you've got that visual dimension tied to data. There is color. I mean, it's using color here. Unfortunately, it's not using color in the actual legend. It just uses the words. Even the fact that the line is solid or broken means something. Now, honestly, you would have to be highly trained and very familiar with how to use this map, but this is a pretty extreme case. So let's, let's take a step back and just build one up from scratch. Here is a map of the 48 contiguous states of the United States. And we're using a graduated symbol to represent total population. But now, is this a bivariate map? Kinda, right? We're using two symbol dimensions representing two different phenomena for states. And the other data happens to be the proportion of the population that drinks to excess. So excessive drinking, and then that state's overall population. This is one way to make a multivariate map or a bivariate map. This is a pretty simple way because you're just showing a layer twice stacked up on top of each other. Here we are applying that coloration to the graduated symbols themselves. So now truly we have a bivariate map. So this is a bivariate symbol where color represents the proportion of the population that drinks excessively and size represents how many people live there in total. Here's another example. This one happens to use the percent of the population that smokes Drinking, smoking, this is all pretty interesting stuff. So I'll use these as examples. The percent of the population that smokes. Uh, lighter areas have a lower proportion of people who smoke and darker areas have a higher proportion of smokers. This is just one dimension of data, but not all counties are the same, right? You, you might have counties where 10 million people live or so, and one county where a few hundred people live. So maybe we can reduce the opacity of those lower population counties. So now we have a bivariate map showing rates of smoking, but it's pushed back in transparency for population. Low population areas are more transparent. High population areas are more opaque. This is called a value by alpha bivariate mapping technique. And you see it a lot for election mapping because that's also an important consideration, of course, is how many votes happen in a place, not just which way they voted. So here's a simple map showing, once again, rates of smoking, but we're just using monochromatic color scheme here grayish blue to a, a deeper blue, rates of smoking, more and less. Here is uh, rates of excessive drinking, more to less, so gray to pink. Now you can, you can calculate where people smoke and drink, or where they smoke and drink very little, where they smoke a lot but don't drink a lot, etc. And you can create a bivariate choropleth map, or a relationship map, and you're showing two dimensions of data concurrently. 
This takes a little bit more horsepower in your mind to actually understand this. In this case, I might rotate that legend slightly to connote the fact that darker mixed colors mean more and lighter mixed colors mean less. The area on the left means high rates of smoking and little drinking, and the area on the right that's very pink is high rates of drinking and very little smoking. Pretty crazy, right? Well, let's, let's segment this out into little groups. Here are counties where both smoking and drinking is really high via the dark blue mixed color and where smoking and drinking is both very low via that light gray. So this is where these two phenomena are correlated with each other. They are both high or low uh, evenly with each other. Conversely, we can we can pick apart areas where there is a, di a dichotomy between these two phenomena. Where do people smoke a lot but don't drink? And where do they drink a lot but don't smoke? That's pretty interesting too. We're looking for relationships. Sometimes there are relationships and sometimes they aren't. But that's why multivariate and bivariate maps are so fun. Speaking of fun, here's another map. This one shows the preference of beer versus wine in people's spending data. This is a bivariate map. So preference uses color and overall spending uses brightness. And we don't, we aren't stuck with color coding everything, right? It doesn't have, we don't have to break out the crayons every time. Can we use different symbol types for multivariate maps? Sure. Here's that same exact data. We just happen to be using little, they're called churn off faces, little cartoon faces that give you an indication one way or another of your data. A little kind of guy who might look like he likes wine more than beer and then how sober are they versus how drunk are they represents overall spending. You can get really creative with this. Sky's the limit. Here's another example. This time we're using the preference of college basketball versus professional basketball and then we're doing a value by alpha approach and dimming down counties with low population and leaving bright areas with high population. A bivariate map. And again here's another way of doing that. Instead of color coding, we're using graduated circles. Some places watch a lot of both, some places watch a little bit of both, some places have a disparity in what they prefer. Now here it is given a slightly altered symbology. Instead of two rings that may overlap each other and cause some issues, why not just show half a ring and say the left side is going to be college basketball and the right half of the ring is professional basketball. I'm just showing you this because there are tons of ways of making a bivariate map. Literally, a kajillion. So we had all those rings, sometimes they're overlapping. What if we just offset the rings so they don't all overlap with each other? We can grow and we can shrink them, but you don't get the problem of occlusion. So this is using happiness data, different factors of happiness. Now, how do you have a legend for something like this? It's pretty complex. I've got six categories of happiness and they're color coded and they're surrounding a center point at various angles. This legend also shows you the fact that if it's smaller and closer to the center then people aren't very happy in that regard and if it's larger and kind of blown out and blooming then they are more happy. It's kind of a complex thing. Here are a handful of other examples. We've got um, all these little complex multivariate symbols showing you these six happiness indicators for every country. Am I really gonna remember what all these stand for? When you have a symbology like this, it's best to reveal it narratively. Uh, so for example, I would show this in a story map and I would say, hey, here are the symbols by the way, this is a key for what these colors mean and all the attributes that they represent. And I would start zooming in on specific areas and talking about where one phenomenon is more than another anomalously, or I would um, highlight one aspect of this versus the others and then bring them all back to you. I would guide the reader through this so they weren't just kind of uh, left to figure this out all by themselves. You can, um, you can walk them through it. Narratively is an excellent way of presenting a multivariate map. Sometimes it's your only prayer. If I didn't have the opportunity to walk somebody through this via a story map or something, I could use a legend like this. So I think of this as a for instance sort of legend. The legend itself decodes it for me. It shows me a couple of extreme cases where everybody's happy in all categories, nobody's happy in any categories, an extreme case where everybody's happy except for one factor, and then perhaps a little wordy version of that. Multivariate maps are inherently a more complex thing. So speaking of lots of colored rings, here's an example where I said, ah, forget it. I'm just gonna stack them all right up on top of each other. The result is at each location, you've got a pretty complex multivariate symbol, a growth ring, or a little bit like a tree ring that shows seasonally the 
appearance of tornado activity in that area. It's color coded by month and it's scaled by uh, is there less or more tornado activity in the area. It's interesting and it's, it's sort of attractive, but it's not terribly practical. So what are some alternatives to multivariate maps? If uh, you have a lot of visual factors that you want to communicate to somebody and you don't necessarily want to make a multivariate map, what can you do? Well, you can just animate them. So here we are showing all of those months one at a time. And the sequence appears to move and you, you start to see, okay, there's like this wave of energy that rolls across the United States in the form of tornadoes and it sweeps up and down, up and down the Great Plains of the United States every year. Another alternative is a small multiple, a simple layout that shows all of the instances individually. Your eyes can dart and make whatever connections they want. This is a small multiple. A small multiple might be a viable alternative to a multivariate map. Speaking of lots of colors, look at this multivariate map with lots of colors. What's going on here? This is, you could say it's a trivariate map. So in the world of printing and graphic design, people think in terms color-wise of CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and key, which is usually black. And it's a way of mixing inks together to create any color possible using these four component inputs. Three, if you only count CMY, which I am. So I've tied the relative amount of cyan to the percent of the population that smokes. The relative amount of magenta has to do with the percent of the population that is obese. And the relative amount of yellow has to do with what percentage of the population are excessive drinkers. How do you make sense of something like this? Even graphic designers will have some issues really wrapping their mind around this. So what do you do? You label the map directly. There's no reason that you have to let the legend do all of that work and all of the heavy lifting. And maybe you can't put it in a story map. Show the data and then describe areas of punctuated examples where there's a lot of something or a little bit of something or interesting relationships. So interesting relationships. That's the name of the game when it comes to bivariate and multivariate maps. Well, I hope that was interesting. I hope it was helpful. Gives you a sense for what's possible. Like I said, there's literally a kajillion different multivariate maps that you can make. Stick with me, and I'm going to show you in the next parts how to make some multivariate maps in ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Online. So stay tuned. See you there.